Jesus continues to heal and cast out impure spirits, but his opponents can't get past their pride and arrogance. It is gonna hate. And in other news, Jesus chooses his 12 apostles. At the end of chapter two, Jesus' followers are accused of breaking the Sabbath because they were pulling the heads off of the grain, AKA harvesting. But Jesus declares that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. And now he doubles down on this claim by healing somebody on the Sabbath. And not just that, but he does it in a synagogue in the midst of religious leaders. And so let us pray for the Lord's guidance as we continue to read as we begin chapter three of Mark's gospel. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? to save life or to kill, but they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Mark is showing us how Jesus is redefining sacred space and sacred time. God has set aside certain days and certain places as sacred, but people have misused this by reinterpreting the law and putting so many restrictions on these days that it negates the positive effect of how they are supposed to be. In other words, Jesus' question to the Pharisees is really accusing them of misinterpreting the law. For he says, which is better to do on the Sabbath? Which is better to do in a synagogue? Good or evil? Without directly saying so, Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of doing evil. They are preventing people from doing good. They are misleading the people. Of course, the irony is that they believe Jesus is doing this, while they are blind to their own actions. And anyone reading the gospel would be able to see this. This again points to the good news. Jesus is the true interpretation of the law, and he speaks with authority. When we look at the man who was healed in the story, I can't help but feel a little sorry for him. I mean, it's great that he's healed, but it's almost as if Jesus is using him as a prop in the story. He tells him to stand out in front of everybody, knowing full well that the Pharisees and the scribes are watching and judging. And then he tells him to stretch out his hand, knowing full well that this is angering the leaders and the teachers of the law. How might this guy be treated afterwards? But this is often the case of those who begin to follow Jesus. They are often ridiculed. Also, as Jesus says elsewhere in the Gospels concerning a man born blind, even the ailment and healing were part of God's plan so that others could see the glory of God. Even our perceived deficiencies can be used for good. And we might rejoice when the Lord uses us to reveal the goodness of God. And I'm sorry, but as I edit this video, I can't help but laugh at the way that the AI that I use to depict some of these pictures struggles to actually interpret what I'm trying to tell it. Because oftentimes it has a lot of difficulty depicting hands. They all look deformed and shriveled. And so I figured, well, it's gonna be easy because this person had a shriveled hand. And now when I tell him to do that, it makes these great looking hands. So it's a bit confusing. I'm sorry, Dave, I don't have enough information. And ironically, when I try to give him a good hand, it's obvious that healing the hand was much easier for Jesus than it was for the AI. Before moving on, I do want to point out one piece of technology that doesn't struggle with the Word of God, and that's Logos. Now, a message from our sponsor. It's a wonderful Bible software program and a portal to a library of translations, commentaries, and other books that let you study the Bible with ease. If you want to look into the smart technology, go ahead and click on one of the links below. You'll get some good deals, and also it helps the channel. Thanks. And now back to our story. We're only in the third chapter of Mark, and we're already being told that the Pharisees are plotting to have Jesus killed. And this brings up a couple of questions. One is, why is he such a threat to them? And secondly, who are these Herodians that they are plotting with? Let's just say inquiring minds want to know. Culture and religion were almost indistinguishable from each other throughout history. And this was true also for the Jews and the Pharisees during the time of Jesus. People trusted the scribes and the Pharisees and their interpretation of the scriptures. Because of this authority, they held a certain amount of religious and political power, not to mention wealth, and they were viewed as respected leaders. Usually, they are easily able to refute any disagreement or challenge to their teachings because they held an education that most Jews did not. They were untouchable. But Jesus challenges them both intellectually and socially. He has a following. 
He has students. He knows the scriptures inside and out, and he performs miracles. The problem is that his interpretation is different from that of the Pharisees. And people react very strongly when you challenge their faith, their religion, their worldview. It's true today, and it was true back then. And for the Pharisees, it wasn't just that Jesus was challenging them, but people were responding to Jesus and his teaching. And if this continues, the Pharisees would lose their authority, their respect, and even their livelihood. But let's not paint all the Pharisees and rabbis with the same brush. For many, Jesus was teaching something that they could not understand, and they believed that he was corrupting the people by an inaccurate interpretation of the law and the prophets. He was challenging what they considered the truth, the word of God. What if he was a heretic and he was driving good Jews away from God? So we can see that they had a number of reasons to fear and even despise Jesus, whether for material or spiritual motives. Of course, wanting him dead was quite an extreme move, but not surprising when we see how religious and political leaders were handled throughout history. And so they begin to plot with the Herodians. So let's see who they were. Herod Antipas was the king of Galilee and Judea during the time of Jesus. He was the son of Herod the Great, who we will hear about in Luke's gospel as the one who massacred all those children when Jesus was born. And I use the word king loosely because he was still subject to the Romans who appointed him and really ruled the area. But he was a good administrator and benefited the occupation by keeping the peace and providing revenue for the empire. Because of his ties to Rome and his questionable lifestyle, many Jews did not have respect for him. But he was Jewish and tried to present himself as an observant Jew when it was politically expedient to do so. For this reason, there was a sizable group of Jews that did respect and support him, and these were aptly called the Herodians. Now, the Pharisees were not particularly fond of them because Herod was not a good example of a faithful Jew. However, Herod and his followers did have reason to fear the popularity of Jesus, and so they could make some useful allies. Enemy of my enemy is my friend. We'll find out later that Herod has John the Baptist beheaded, and many of John's followers actually became followers of Jesus. And Herod also has a pretty good thing going, so he doesn't want to be threatened by this new upstart. It's good to be the king. And if Jesus really is the Messiah, this could cause a major shift in power that could ruin Herod's dynasty. And for the Pharisees, it would be much better if they were seen to be working with Jews, even if they did support Herod, than working directly with the Romans. The next few verses act as a bridge to show that despite this opposition, the ministry of Jesus continues to flourish and its popularity continues to grow throughout the region. So let's continue reading. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Adumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus then leaves the synagogue and begins to teach near the Sea of Galilee, where he had first began his ministry and called his first disciples. And here the crowds not only from Galilee come to see him, but they also come from all over the place and from everywhere that really Israelites have settled, including Edumea, where the descendants of Esau had settled. We are also told of places that Jesus will visit later in his ministry, such as Jerusalem and Tyre and Sidon. It is also worth noting that he had his disciples get a boat ready for him so he can move away from the crowds but still speak to them. His ministry now officially goes on the road, or the water as it is. And also it's interesting that Mark never mentions Jesus entering or preaching in a synagogue again from this point forward. Instead, Jesus goes to where the people are, where they work, where they live. He preaches in boats and fields, mountainsides and homes. This may be a foreshadowing of what will happen to the early Christians. Eventually, they will no longer pray in the synagogues, but will form communities in such places. Jesus begins to distance himself from the religious leaders, but continues to draw large crowds to himself. These passages don't give us a whole lot of new information about Jesus or his ministry, but that he continues to heal people and cast out impure spirits. And these impure spirits or demons appear quite often in Mark's gospel. And while they oppose Jesus, they also know who he is. And here they are not just saying that he is a holy one of God, but that he is the son of God. And yet, Jesus still tells them, no, he gives them orders to remain silent. 
This shows his authority, but also continues the theme of the messianic secret. The time. His time has not yet come. Remember, Jesus is Lord over time, as we have seen, and he's just getting started. Now that Jesus has symbolically began to walk away from one iteration of organized religion, he must now build his own new community, his new church. In order to do so, he will choose 12 that will become its foundation. Jesus went up a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. As far as we know, this is the earliest list of the 12 apostles that we have, and there are quite a few details in this passage. First of all, Jesus goes up a mountain, and mountains are very symbolic in many religious traditions, including the Jewish tradition and Greek mythology. Mount Sinai and Mount Olympus immediately come to mind. They represent a closeness to the divine, and this symbolism would not be missed by Jewish or Greek Christians. Jesus calls those he wants, they respond, and he appoints 12. This number is not arbitrary. Jacob, or Israel, had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel, with a few substitutions. You can watch my commentary on Genesis to get some more information about that. But the important thing is that the people of Israel claim their descendants from these individuals, these 12 tribes. So you might be able to see where we're going with this. Jesus is appointing this new 12, and their spiritual descendants will make up this new church, this new family, as we will see later in this chapter. Now, these 12 are typically referred to as apostles to distinguish them from the other disciples who would include any of Jesus' followers. The name apostle comes from the Greek word apostele in verse 14, which means to be sent. So his new church is one of action. His followers whom he called will then be sent to continue his work. And they are sent to do exactly what he has been doing thus far, preaching and driving out demons. In other words, he is sharing his authority with them. So, Who were these men? The first on the list is Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Now, this is very significant, but Mark doesn't give us the backstory on how his name was changed. Of course, Peter would have been a very significant figure in the early Christian community and to those that Mark was writing to. So Mark is making sure that they know that this Peter is the same as the Simon that he mentioned earlier. It is in Matthew's gospel that we'll get the story of when and why Jesus changed his name. But it does once again show Jesus' authority, considering that typically God is the one who changes a person's name. So Simon, I mean Peter, is listed first, which is significant. Also notice that he is not listed with his brother, like James and John are. And these details further set him apart to show that he has a special place amongst the apostles. Next in the list are the brothers, James and John, whom he gave the name Sons of Thunder. Another name change without a backstory in this gospel, although we will hear about their impulsiveness and ambition a bit later. Still, Peter, James, and John will often be chosen to witness certain events in Jesus' life that the other apostles do not. They seem to be the three closest to Jesus as our story continues. Then we have Andrews and the others, with Judas Iscariot being listed last. A few notes on some of the other names. We do see Matthew is listed instead of Levi, which suggests that they may have indeed been the same person. We are given the name of the second James' father to distinguish him from Zebedee's son, and the second Simon, we are told, was a zealot, which was a faction of Jews who tended to be more militant, believing that the Messiah would be a military leader that would overthrow the Romans. Also, some may be wondering about the absence of Jude, who is often seen in the lists of the apostles. Well, Jude and Judas are really the same name, so no one wants to be associated with the Judas who betrayed Jesus. So many believe that he is listed as Thaddeus. Later, the more familiar version, Jude, becomes more popular. I think it's kind of funny that many of the apostles have the same names. I mean, in any close group of friends, oftentimes people with the same names would be given nicknames or alternate names to distinguish them. And I'm sure it was no different with this group. Also, it's an interesting bit of literary evidence that challenges those who suggest that the Gospels are just fictional accounts. Who would give so many of their main characters the same name? Not only that, these people were known in the communities to which these accounts were written. 
We've already said quite a bit about these verses, but what can we take away from them? And one theme that I see that comes across in these passages is the concept of time. The Greeks had two words for time, chronos and kairos. Chronos speaks of time as it is measured, morning, evening, two o'clock, three hours, tomorrow, and so on. It is specific and something that we have deceived ourselves into thinking we have control over. Kairos, on the other hand, is the concept of time as an opportune moment or season. It may have originated from an archery term, meaning the perfect opening to shoot an arrow. But here, we can see it as God's time, a moment ordained for something special. The Pharisees are stuck in Kronos. They have measured everything and put barriers around all the laws that they are limiting not only themselves, but also their experience of God. But Jesus shows us that we cannot control time, we cannot control God, and when we do so, we are indeed limiting ourselves, and we are in a sense limiting how God can work within our lives. We also fail to see God outside of the time that we have carved out for him. We don't just encounter God on Saturday or Sunday or whatever day you consider the Lord's day. Every day is holy. Every day is God's day. We don't just think about God during prayer or in silent reflection, but can see the Lord in every moment. God is not only in the churches or sunsets or majestic landscapes. I'm not saying he's not in those places, quite the contrary. But God is everywhere and in every person. We need to stop limiting God. When we open ourselves to Kairos, we open ourselves to God's time and God's plan. We invite the Lord into our conversations with friends, our long hours of work, our vacations, our joys, and our struggles. What would life look like if we believed that God was present with us in every moment, in every activity? How might we act differently? How might we view creation, our neighbors? Jesus invites us to break out of Kronos and enter into Kairos, enter into God's time. And with that, our time draws to a close. But thank you so much for joining me, and I would love to hear your thoughts on anything that we covered in this episode. What are your thoughts on time, or Jesus' departure from the synagogues, or his new community of disciples? So I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, consider Kairos, and God bless.